Hey guys, this video is brought to you by AerospacePal.com. We deliver free content tailored specifically to the aerospace community. Come check out the site. In this video, we'll be going over Section 20 of D160, Radio Frequency Susceptibility. Section 20 of D160 covers radiated and conducted susceptibility. We'll be going over radiated susceptibility in this video. During this test, we're going to purposely broadcast radio frequencies onto the EUT and interconnecting cable. The test frequencies run all the way from 100 MHz to 18 GHz. That means that there's a slight overlap with conducted susceptibility in the 100 MHz to 400 MHz range. The purpose of Section 20 is to ensure your system can handle environments with HERF high intensity radio frequency. TPEDs, which is transmitting portable electronic devices, and other installed system emissions. Before we get into categories, we need to talk about the two different methods for testing radiated susceptibility. The first is the anechoic chamber method. This method uses two different antenna polarities, vertical and horizontal, to test your EUT. The second method, the reverberation method or reverb method, does not have antenna polarities but rather a stirring stick or paddle used to reflect or bounce radiated energy in all directions. This paddle rotates at 4 revolutions per minute under 1 gig and 2 revolutions per minute above 1 gig. A full revolution is required for CW, SW, and pulse. I anticipate the reverb method being the certification method of choice in the future. So if you're qualifying a product today, and you anticipate qualifying by similarity to this product in the future, consider using the reverberation method. Now getting back to the category, section 20 consists of two letters. The first refers to the conducted susceptibility level, the second refers to the radiated susceptibility level. Again, we'll be discussing radiated susceptibility in this video. Don't pay too much attention to the category descriptions in section 20. Just know that the criticality of the system and the system environment determine the test level. I promise to follow up with a video on how aircraft manufacturers select categories depending on the system and their location. There is a calibration required for radiated susceptibility. Both calibrations for RS and CS are quite similar. Both use the test equipment setup to record the forward power required to achieve the category level at each frequency. However, RS uses the actual equipment setup on the conductive bench to determine the loading effects as seen by the test equipment. This means if you have multiple setups, you'll have to do multiple calibrations because the loading effect in the room has changed. It's important here to note that all apertures of the UT need to be directly exposed to the transmitting antenna. So if you have connectors on opposite sides of your UT, this will require multiple setups. If multiple setups are required to test all apertures, consider using just one setup and the reverberation method. The test setup for radiated susceptibility gets real specific if you're talking about the anechoic chamber method. The diagram shown here shows the first bundle is 10 centimeters away from the edge of the bench exactly. If you have multiple bundles routed in one direction, space the subsequent bundles 5 centimeters from each other going towards the back of the bench. If testing using the reverb method, cables should be routed in the bundles specified by the aircraft wiring harness. However, location of routing does not matter as long as it's within the uniform field. Now this test is typically done at a testing house because of the complexity of the test and the cost of the equipment. During this test, the test engineer will apply a sine wave, square wave, and pulse modulation derived from the forward power achieved during calibration. The test engineer will likely switch the equipment for pulse modulation, but recalibration is not required. This test will use multiple lab equipment setups to sweep from 100 MHz to 18 GHz. Now this is not intended as a damage test, but if you're testing high levels like CAT G or L, it's possible to see damage. The acceptance criteria should always be written to state that there shall be no system performance degradation during the test, or something equivalent. Monitor your equipment during the test and ensure that you pass. Hey, thanks for watching this video. If you found this informative, interesting, or just better than reading a 500 page standard, stop back at aerospacepal.com and tell other engineers about this free resource. Don't have a copy of D160? Check out the link below.